The subject is love. The text is 1 Corinthians 13. For several weeks, we have been working our way through the 15 characteristics of love that are found in verses 4 through 7. Thus far in our study, we've examined the first five of these 15 characteristics. We have noted that love is patient, love is kind, love does not envy, love does not boast, love is not proud. This morning, we're going to examine the sixth and seventh characteristics of love. These two characteristics are stated negatively in much the same way as several of the other characteristics are stated negatively. Love, God tells us, is not rude. And love is not self-seeking. Let's begin with the sixth characteristic of love. In our examination of these two, love is not rude. To be rude is to be impolite. To be rude is to be discourteous. To be rude is to be unpleasant. There's really an obligation to be pleasant. <laughs> there really is. To be rude is to be crude and inhospitable and indifferent to the needs of others. We could go on and on listing the nasty characteristics of being rude, but you get the idea. One of the characteristics of the unloving person is that he is rude, and that includes all of these characteristics and others. The loving person, on the other hand, is not rude. The loving person is impolite, as is polite rather than being impolite, courteous rather than being discourteous, pleasant rather than being unpleasant, well-mannered as opposed to being crude, hospitable as opposed to being inhospitable, and graciously inclined toward the needs of others rather than being indifferent toward the needs of others. Now, we evangelical Christians often fail to emphasize some of these social graces. And we fail to emphasize these social graces because there are more pressing issues that concern us, and there really are issues that are more pressing than developing social graces. To begin with, we live in a world that has rejected the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So we need to devote a lot of time and energy trying to get the world to embrace the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And not only do we need to devote a lot of time trying to get the world to embrace the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, we also need to devote a lot of time and energy on trying to make ourselves the godly men and women God expects us to be. That's an overwhelming job in itself. Well, for some of you, it isn't maybe so tough, but for some of us, it's monumental. The older I get, the more monumental I see it being. Defending the faith and trying to live godly lives are issues that demand most of our attention. And because... These more important issues take up so much of our time and energy. The social graces that God expects us to develop and exercise often fall by the wayside. This is really too bad because God does expect us to be socially pleasant. I'm not a liberal, folks. <laughs> I know you're going to say you're sounding like Norman Vincent Peale or Margaret Schuler. I am not. God really does expect us to be pleasant people. He does, for a variety of reasons. One of which, social graces give credibility to our testimony in a dark world. When Christians are courteous and well-mannered and gracious, there's a sweet aroma that wafts up from them. Isn't that a great word, wafts up? My wife and I love words. Wafts up. And people notice it. 
William Barclay wrote about this sweet aroma. Love, Barclay wrote, does not behave itself gracelessly. It is a significant fact that in Greek, the words for grace, a word we love, right? Grace, we love grace. The words grace and charm are the same. There is a kind of Christianity which takes a delight in being blunt and almost brutal. There's strength in this, but there is no winsomeness. Barclay continues, A teacher wrote this about one of his students. Let him go where he will. His face will be a sermon in and of itself. There is a graciousness in Christian love which never forgets that courtesy and tact and politeness are lovely things. Don MacArthur wrote, Self-righteous rudeness by Christians can turn people away from Christ before they have a chance to hear the gospel. The messenger can become a barrier to the message. If people do not see the gentleness of Christ clearly in us, they are less likely to see him clearly in the gospel we preach. The loving person is not rude. Rather than being impolite, he is polite. Rather than being discourteous, he is courteous. Rather than being unpleasant, he is pleasant. Rather than being crude, he is well-mannered. Rather than being inhospitable, he is hospitable. Rather than being indifferent to the needs of others, he is graciously inclined toward the needs of others. There's a wonderful story that illustrates the graciousness toward the needs of others that is found in a truly loving person. A small town hired an elderly man named Bill to sweep some of its sidewalks. Bill was a kind man, and he worked hard at doing a good job. Each week, when Bill passed the house of a woman named Miss Giddings, Miss Giddings would give Bill a glass of lemonade and a slice of cake. Bill would shyly thank her and then move on. One evening, there was a knock on Miss Giddings' door. She answered the door, and there was Bill with a sack of peaches in one hand and a handful of roasting ears in the other. He seemed embarrassed as he said, I brought you these, ma'am, because you have been so kind to me. Oh, you shouldn't have, Miss Giddings said. It was nothing. To which Bill replied, Well, it may not have been much to you, ma'am, but it was more than anyone else did. Now, I'm certain that many of the other people whose sidewalks Bill swept appreciated his work. They did. And they were not deliberately unkind. But for the most part, they didn't think in terms of expressing their appreciation to Bill because they were not that graciously inclined toward the needs of others. The loving person is. It's really very sad that more aren't. Now before leaving our discussion of those characteristics that are the opposite of being rude, something needs to be said about hospitality. In this age of entertainment centers with their high definition TVs and hundreds of channels to choose from and Netflix and lots of motels and hotels and restaurants, hospitality has taken a severe blow. Before the introduction of these technological marvels, people spent a lot more time entertaining friends in their homes. Now they don't. Hospitality is not what it used to be. Today, inhospitality reigns. Now, if you are committed to being inhospitable, Jason Thomas of the Chicago Tum Sun Jason Thomas of the Chicago Sun Times. I almost stutter and stammer when I mention a secular newspaper. It's, it's a problem. <laughs> At least it isn't the New York Times. Jason Thomas of the Chicago Sun-Times has made a list of some 
surefire ways of getting rid of your unwanted guests. This is what he wrote. Number one, buy a folding cot. They sag, they squeak, and a really terrible cot will sometimes collapse in the middle of the night. Number two, if you have a sofa bed, fold it away in the morning while the guest is still sleeping in it. <laughs> Pretend that you were partly asleep or that you thought he'd move to the YMCA. Number three, never change the sheets. Never change the towels and put something odd smelling in the pillows. Number four, borrow a large, friendly, and preferably unhoused broken pet and be sure that it loves the guest and hope gets hopelessly excited whenever it manages to leap into the middle of the guest's bed. Number five, if your guest is on a diet, prepare only chocolate mousse and whipped cream for breakfast, something I actually kind of think would be good. And pay attention, Nancy. <laughs> Otherwise, keep all meals to black coffee and prunes. Number six, by following these helpful hints, most guests will start looking for other accommodations, so it might be a good idea to keep the yellow pages open to hotel listings. Now, Jason Thomas was concerned about the lack of hospitality that exists in our country today. To the best of my knowledge, he isn't a believer, so he isn't going through the book of 1 Corinthians to take note of these characteristics that a loving person exhibits. He's just making an observation as a journalist, and it concerned him. He wrote this piece partly out of humor, but partly out of concern. Now, the minute we mention something like this, there are a lot of folks who will protest by saying, it's my house, I can do with it as I see fit. I can have guests or not have guests. It's my house. Really now. Is it really your house? To those of you who believe that it's really your house, Jill Briscoe has something to say to you. One of my wife's favorite quotes from Jill Briscoe. So if you don't like it, blame her. Jill Briscoe said this, It is not your house. It is God's house. God owns everything in the universe, including your house, and whoever he wants to invite into his house is his business, not yours. Strong. Jill's right, of course. When it comes to the issue of owning things, God owns everything. And as the owner of everything, he has a right to do what he wants to do with everything that he owns. And that includes those things of his that he has allowed you to use for a season. The loving person is not rude. He is polite, he is courteous, he is pleasant and well-mannered, and he is hospitable. Loving person is all of these things because consciously or unconsciously, he recognizes that to a certain extent, we're all stuck with each other. We all share the same space. Now, this is especially true for those who are part of the same family, and to a lesser extent, for those who work together or worship together. But whether we live together or work together or worship together, the simple truth is that we all share the same space. For example, at this very moment, we are all sharing space in this auditorium. We're all sharing space in this room. And each of us has a responsibility to make certain that his or her portion of this shared space is comfortable for everyone else. A loving person will do just that. A loving person will want to make certain that his or her portion of our shared space is comfortable for everyone. The rude man, however, doesn't care one bit about making certain that his portion of our shared space is comfortable for everyone else. All he cares about is himself. He cares nothing about the comfort of others. And all too often, he is even proud of being this way. 
This is what makes it so really obnoxious. He's proud of it. And we know this to be the case because he loves telling us that he doesn't care what other people think about him. He even wears this as a, as a, as a badge of honor. I don't care what people think about me. I'll do what I want. I don't care what people think. We think this is bold and courageous. It's not. I don't care what people think about me. And he tells us that over and over again. Let me give you a translation. I'll do as I please, and the rest of you can drop dead. That's what that means. And you wear that as a badge of honor? That's rude. That's unloving. And the godly man doesn't have that attitude. We live in a fallen and cursed world. At its best, it is often a very painful place in which to live. The rude man makes it even worse by refusing to exercise the social graces that will make our shared space a more pleasant space in which to live. All of which brings us to the Corinthian Christians, the Christians to whom Paul was writing this letter. The Corinthians were rude. Reading in chapter 11, beginning of verse 17, Paul wrote, In the following directives, I have no praise for you, for your meetings do more harm than good. In the first place, I hear that when you come together as a church, there are divisions among you, and to some extent, I believe it. No doubt, there have to be differences among you to show which of you has God as, have, which of you have God's approval. When you come together, it is not the Lord's supper you eat, for as you eat, each of you goes ahead without waiting for anyone else. One remains hungry, another gets drunk. Don't you have homes to eat and drink in? Or do you despise the church of God and humiliate those who have nothing? What shall I say to you? Shall I praise you for this? Certainly not. The rich Corinthian Christians were not sharing their food with their poor brothers and sisters. Many of the poor could only bring a little. And the slaves, who were very much a part of the early church, often brought nothing. Apparently, the rich were getting together by themselves and hurrying through the meal so they wouldn't have to share with the poor. Rude! Their social differences, as a result, were being exaggerated. And the poor were being shut out. What do you do when you're shut out? You can retaliate, of course, many do. But there's a better way, a more godly way. An unknown poet expressed it this way. He drew a circle that shut me out. Rebel, heretic thing to flout, but love and I had the wit to win. We drew a circle that took him in. The sixth characteristic of love that God gives us in his list of 15 characteristics of love is a characteristic that is stated negatively. Love, God tells us, is not rude. Love works at making our shared space a pleasant place for all of us. It is a tough world. Life is miserable for many of us and really miserable for some of us. We all have a responsibility to develop social graces that will make our shared space comfortable for everyone. I don't care what people think of me is disgusting. If you wear that, it is not a badge of honor. It's a badge of disgrace. What you're saying, in effect, is I don't really care about anybody but myself. If you don't like the way I act, if you don't like what I do, drop dead. Disgusting. And it's time we stopped it. I've seen it over and over again. People think that they're being courageous, when in fact they're being disgusting. Now, the seventh characteristic of love is also stated negatively. Love, God tells us, is not self-seeking. Love is not self-seeking. The person who is self-seeking is the person who, ex who insists on exercising his rights. You've met the type. I have my rights. I'm going to exercise them. He is the person who insists that we all do things his way. And woe be to the person who refuses to do things his way. 
The Corinthian church, as many of you know, was filled with men and women who were self-seeking. The Corinthian church was filled with men and women who insisted on exercising their rights no matter what. Paul wrote about some of these people in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, beginning in verse 1. If any of you has a dispute with another, dare he take it before the ungodly for judgment instead of before the saints? Do you not know that the saints will judge the world? And if you are to judge the world, are you not competent to judge trivial cases? Do you not know that we will judge angels? How much more the things of this life? Therefore, if any of you have disputes about such matters, appoint as judges even men of little account in the church. I say this to shame you. Is it possible that there is nobody among you wise enough to judge a dispute between believers? But instead, one brother goes to law against another, and this in front of unbelievers. The very fact that you have lawsuits among you means you have been completely defeated already. Why not rather be wrong? Why not rather be cheated? Instead, you yourselves cheat and do wrong, and you do this to your brother. Strong statement. Why not rather be cheated? It's okay to get nailed now and then. Better that than cause a stink, particularly in the secular courts. Love, God tells us, is not self-seeking. Love does not demand its rights when it comes to fellow believers and close friends. Love does not insist that we do everything its way. God tells us that it is better to be cheated than to be obsessed with getting your own way. And love understands this. I want my rights. No, you really don't. You have a right to hell. That's what you have a right to. Everything else is grace. Get over it. I'm really sort of sick of it. It's a problem with democracy. <laughs> now, don't misunderstand. I don't want to move back to England to be under the rule of a king. But we have this obsession with rights. We should be obsessed with grace. We should be obsessed with grace. The self-seeking person, frankly, is a pain to everyone around him for obvious reasons. And not only is he a pain to everyone around him, he is a pain to himself because no one wants a friend who always insists on having his own way. Pay attention to those of you who have no friends. <laughs> really, as a pastor, invariably one of the biggest problems talking to any pastor, there are a variety of very common problems to all pastors. One is, nobody loves me. Nobody loves me. Am I mocking it yet? You know why? Because you're not a friend. You want to make friends, you got to be a friend. And churches have a lot of functions. People come late, only come to one, Sunday morning service, come late, leave early, nobody loves me. Now, don't misunderstand. We all need to work harder at encouraging people who maybe are a little shy and a little uh, less uh, obvious. We need to work hard at being friends. But, you know, so often, if you don't have friends, it's because you're not a friend. Because you don't take advantage of the opportunities. Or maybe you're just a miserable person. <laughs> well, you know, nobody wants friends who are miserable. Nobody wants self-seeking friends. Who wants a friend who always insists on his or her way? Really, folks, the self-seeking person is a pain to everyone around him for obvious reasons. And not only... Is he a pain to everyone around him? He's a pain to himself because no one wants a friend who always insists on having his own way. The self-seeking man is usually unloved, whereas the selfless man is almost always loved and adored. It's easy to make friends in evangelical churches. I'm telling you, folks, if you'll log the time and be friendly, you'll make friends. We're predisposed to it. We're predisposed to it. The inscriptions on two tombstones in Great Britain express these two points very well. The first tombstone is in the graveyard of a small English village, and it reads, Here lies a miser who lived for himself and cared for nothing but gathering his wealth. Now where he is or how he fares, nobody knows. Nobody cares. 
The second tombstone is that of General Charles Gordon. Some of you military historians know about Charles Gordon. He was one of England's greatest and most beloved generals. His tombstone is in the graveyard of St. Paul's Cathedral in London. It reads, Sacred to the memory of General Charles George Gordon, who at all times and everywhere gave his strength to the weak, his substance to the poor, his sympathy to the suffering, and his heart to God. Memorize it. General Gordon, a great and beloved man. He had no trouble making friends. The truly loving person is not rude and is not self-seeking. The truly loving person gives his strength to the weak, his substance to the poor, his sympathy to the suffering, and his heart to God. That pretty much says it all, doesn't it? Nothing more needs to be said. Father, we love you. We worship you. We thank you for being a God. And I pray, Father, that we will have the same attitude that General Gordon had. I pray that we will begin by giving our hearts to you. And then, Father, I pray we will develop the social graces that will help us be gracious and kind and loving and caring to those around us. I pray, Father, that we will be a church that not only stands up and fights for the great doctrines of the faith, that we will not only be a church filled with men and women who want to live godly lives. I pray, Father, we'll be a church filled with men who will develop the social graces you want us to develop so that in every way Jesus will be glorified. And it is in his name that we pray. Amen.